Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you with us. We are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. For the second quarter, this would be the months, months of April through June of 2013. It's a series of lessons entitled Major Lessons from Minor Prophets. I have found it fascinating so far, and I'm sure that it's going to be fascinating for the rest of, this, of our times together for this set of lessons. This particular lesson is lesson number six in that series for May 11 of 2013, entitled, Eager to Forgive the Story of Jonah. Now, you probably already know it wasn't Jonah that was eager to forgive, so who is eager to forgive? And that will be one of the questions we want to deal with in our discussion today. Before we begin, and I hope you have your Bibles handy, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, how many of us would have done what Jonah did? How often do we try to avoid our spiritual responsibilities? Now, not many of us have been thrown into the ocean to be swallowed by a fish. I hope none of us. But there are lessons to be learned from the experience of this sad prophet. May we see it. May we learn what we should is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Jonah. We presumably all know it pretty well. Remember, God gave him a message, go to Nineveh. He ran away to Joppa. He got on a boat. There was a terrible storm. Finally, they decided he was the one responsible. They threw him over and the storm stopped immediately. He was swallowed by a big creature in the sea. You can't tell for sure from the original Hebrew whether it was a fish or whether it was, could have been a whale or something else. Who knows? The whale spit him up on the shore. He went back home and God says, Oh, by the way, Jonah, remember I had a job for you. <laughs> and Jonah says, Okay, I'll go to Nineveh. And so he went and preached and the city repented. Amazing amazing. Well, Jonah went out and sat there on the, somewhere outside the city hoping he was going to see the city destroyed. It didn't happen. And then when there was that little plant that came up that gave him some shade and he thought that was wonderful. And then God sent a little worm to destroy the plant. And now Jonah is upset once again. And it ends with God asking a very significant question, which hopefully we'll have time to get to. Were you going to comment, Norm? Oh, no. Oh, later. <laughs> um, is Nineveh a Jewish town or a non-Jewish town? No. Nineveh was a huge, was the capital city, really, of Assyria. And they were Israel's worst enemies at that point in time. They were not a Jewish. And they, they didn't worship God? No. They worshiped the God of war. Okay. They, had, they had the largest standing army I mean, percentage-wise, compared to the size of their population, of any nation before them or since in the Middle East, maybe in the entire world. Mm -hmm. They worshipped war. So, um, you know, that's not a whole lot different than, than this country. No, today. just a minute. Let's We've, this country has had w been at war for over a hundred years. Yeah. So, and it, it is the military-industrial complex that keeps things uh, yeah. churning. Well, the story of Jonah is well known, and people laugh about his foibles. Um, too many modern people just think it's a fairy, some kind of a fairy tale. Um, they've heard about the big fish. They know virtually nothing about the rest of the story of Jonah. They, they could really care less, by and large. But when we talk about the story of Jonah, we need to remember that Jesus said some very interesting things in Matthew 12, 39 to 41, and I will... Take this opportunity to read those verses for you. How evil and godless are the people of this day, Jesus exclaimed. You ask me for a miracle? No. The only miracle you will be given is the miracle of the prophet Jonah. What was the miracle of the prophet Jonah? In the same way that Jonah spent three days and nights in the big fish, so will the Son of Man spend three days and nights in the depths of the earth. On judgment day, the people of Nineveh will stand up and accuse you. And who is he talking to? 
He's talking about the religious, he's talking to the religious leaders of the Jewish people that were supposed to be his faithful followers. The people of Nineveh will stand up and condemn you, accuse you, because they turned from their sins when they heard Jonah preach. And I tell you that there is something here greater than Jonah. How's that for a start? Well, so if we reject the story of Jonah, we're calling Jesus a liar, is that what yeah, you said? that's what I'm saying. Well, look at 2 Kings 14, starting with verse 23, to get a little background. And we're going we're gonna to spend a fair amount of time just looking at the main players in the book of Jonah, because when you see all the main players and you see how they interact, it's a pretty amazing story. 2 Kings 14, verse 23. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Amaziah, son of Joash, as king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, became king of Israel, and he ruled in Samaria for forty-one years. He sinned against the Lord, following the wicked example of his predecessor king, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who led Israel into sin. He reconquered all the ter territory that had belonged to Israel, from Hamath Pass in the north to the Dead Sea in the south. So he apparently was a good general and a military leader. This was what the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised to his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, from gath -Hefer. Whoa! So Jonah is a, what kind of a character? He's a historical character that the Bible talks about elsewhere. So this isn't just a fairy tale. At least the character seems to have been for real. Now, what was Jonah's job? Well, he was a prophet. What is that? We don't know for sure, but it sounds in that passage almost like he may have worked for the king. Okay. And I don't know exactly what a prophet does working for a king, but he predicted something accurately, in the, and the people of the northern kingdom went out and did it. Well, historically, we know that the northern king country or the northern kingdom of Israel was about 50 years away from being destroyed by the Assyrians, with their capital, by the way, at Nineveh. Israel had already been threatened and overrun by the Assyrians several times, being forced to pay tribute to them. In order to understand the book of Jonah, we need to, to consider what we know about each of the principal participants. Okay. Let's start out with the one that people probably think about the most, the big fish. There are, now people think, what a crazy notion. I mean, how could a person be followed, swallowed by a fish and three days later he's spit out on the shore? Well, there are in fact numerous stories in both ancient times and even more modern times when human beings and even large animals have been swallowed by fish or large sea creatures such as large sharks and even whales. And I quote, One of the most modern examples was reported in the Weekly World News of June 16, 1987, where the headlines read, Shark swallows fisherman, then spits him out alive. The lucky man was named Mikado Nakamura, and he gave an interview to the newspaper from his hospital bed in, the Kanazawa, in Kanazawa, Japan. Mm. Wow. So, it's possible. So we're just trying to make the story a little bit more believable, okay? How long do you think Jonah was actually in the belly of that fish or whale? Well, if we were to count the time that he was there backwards from the way that Jesus was in the tomb, mm -hmm. it could have been 24 hours plus a little bit on each side of that. Yes, very easily. And that's an important point. It, we need to compare this story with the story of Jesus. The Jews counted any part of day as if it was a whole day. So a part of a Friday, all day Saturday, and a part of a Sunday is three days. Okay? And just for a little bit of interesting reading to start out our story, a former drug addict, now turned preacher, told of many disturbing statistics about drug abuse. He then propounded his Bible and said, it was the only answer. Afterwards, a drug addict asked him if he really believed all those stories in the Bible. He said, yes. 
Then he was asked if he believed in the story of Noah and even Jonah. Again he said, yes. Then the questioner asked what he thought Jonah was thinking while in the belly of that big fish. After thinking for a moment, he replied that he would just have to ask Jonah when he got to heaven. What if Jonah doesn't go to heaven? Asked the questioner. Then you can ask him, replied the preacher. <laughs> Another story I, I really enjoyed. Now, I know some of these people. A teacher in Idaho asked a group of children what they learned from the story of Jonah. One child re responded, even the fish learned that you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now to some more serious stuff. What do we know about Nineveh and Assyria? Assyria? Pretty rough creatures. They were a violent pagan. I mean, this is a nation that worshipped war. One of the earlier kings said he, was gonna, he would paint the tops of mountains with the blood of his enemies. I mean, imagine what kind of uh, that thing that would be. Yet these Ninevites repented when they heard of God's impending judgment, whereas the Israelites kept ignoring similar messages sent to them. Thus, the book was a challenge to the self-righteous and ethnocentric attitudes of the Israelites. And really, that's largely what this book is all about. So, what do we know about Assyria? Let's just look at a few things quickly. It was a prominent Assyrian city on the east bank of the Tigris River, about 280 miles north of Babylon. It was founded by Nimrod, along with Rehoboth Ir, Kela, and Rezin. Read in Genesis 10, 11 to 12, forming a massive urban quadrangle about 60 miles across. It was a perpetual rival of Babylon for beauty and splendor with its royal palaces, temples, broad streets, public gardens, and an impressive library containing more than 26,000 clay tablets, one of the largest in the ancient world. So this was a, a center of learning. What um, country would that be in today? It would be in Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. In fact, we have some personal friends who came from the current city, which is very near to ancient Nineveh. Yeah. In northern Iraq? Yes, it's the northern part of Iraq now. Mm -hmm. Is that where the Kurds might be? Or is that uh, too south? The Kurds are a little bit further north. Further north, okay. Yeah. I know I, I don't know Iraq personally, so I mean there's probably some overlapping. I don't, I don't know about that, possibly. N think about this. Nineveh was surrounded by a, out, an outer wall and an inner wall. These walls were 100 feet high, at least in some parts, and 50 feet wide. I mean, try to imagine a wall of that size. Now, it's made of just mud brick, so they're not too hard to make, but that's what it was. It was irrigated by the Kasa River, whose flow was controlled by a dam built by Sennacherib, and also by a large aqueduct that carried water from a second, from a second dam 30 miles away. They had organized that to bring extra water so it would make sure the city would have enough. Later, we're going to study the prophets Nahum and Zephaniah, who had some pretty serious warnings for the Ninevites about their ultimate demise. Go ahead. In, uh, in Nineveh, they liked war, but how were the people uh, themselves? Uh, were they um, kind to one another? Were they always warring with an, one another? Or what was the character of the city? They believed that who, the strong made right. The might makes right. Okay. Yeah. Well, the city was destroyed in 612 AD, BC. I'm sorry. I've got an error in my printing here, by a siege of Babylonians, Scythians, and Medes, who penetrated its defenses when sudden floods eroded the walls. So nice to have a river going through the town, but if all of a sudden it overflows its banks and wipes out your walls, you're in trouble. And the ancient Nineveh quickly became a mound of ruins that was ignored from that day for 2,500 year years until just about a century ago. Assyria had become legendary for its cruelty. Their repentance probably followed three major events in their history. You know, um, just thinking about this a little bit, um, what, what, what kind of things did these ancient peoples look to in their 
in their uh, religious practices. What, they yeah. look to the stars. Yeah. And, and celestial events, right? Well, just before this time when Jonah showed up, there were two major plagues. We don't know too much details that they talk about plagues. One in 765 B.C. and one in 759 B.C. And a solar eclipse, and those always scared the ancients to half to death, in 763 B.C. And it may be that these events helped to prepare the Ninevites for the coming of Jonah. There had to have been something. Yeah. yeah it's I mean, a, the, just Jonah going and speaking with him. Yeah. A city that was accustomed to practicing war, that was their main emphasis and so forth. And one man shows up and they all are, are in repentance in a few days. It's amazing. Well, they had experienced something greater than war. They had experienced God moving nature. Mm -hmm. And um, so maybe that scared them, the might. Do you well, think that, that Jonah <clears throat> knew about the repentance? In Nineveh. In Nineveh. Yeah. Then he could have had an opportunity to go talk to God and say, hey, they're repenting. What are you going to do about this? <laughs> yeah, he had a conversation with God about that. We'll get to that. But that was later. I that mean, was later. During the time that they oh. were repenting. No, no. In other words, how could he have, <clears throat> how should he have reacted? Yeah. When they were repenting, then he should have recognized their repentance, gone and talked to God and say, Hey, is this what you want? Okay. Are, are they going to be okay? We haven't got to the Jonah part of the story yet. Uh, wh what was Jonah's situation, and, and how do you think he would respond to a change in heart by the, by the Ninevites? We'll get to that in a moment. I, okay. I, wanna, I don't want to jump over there right now. Well, let's just understand what, what's the relationship between these Assyrians and the Israelites. Assyria had dominated the central portion of the ancient Near East for almost 300 years, starting around 900 B.C. down to about 600 B.C. Just literally dominated, almost. There were, of course, you know how human history is. It was, there were some ups and downs, but basically they dominated. So Ahab, back in the early years of Israel, had to pay tribute to the Assyrians. Jehu, a little bit later in Israelite history, had to pay tribute to the Assyrians. Azariah, the king of Judah, had to pay tribute to the Assyrians. Menahem, again, back in Israel, had to pay tribute to the Assyrians. It is estimated that the walled city of Nineveh contained about 160,000 citizens. If you include the people who lived in nearby villages, it is possible that, to that the total went up to 2 million. So it's a pretty, pretty impressive encampment, if you and will. And they're all Assyrians? Yeah. So, just a couple more notes about Nineveh. In 792 B.C., and not just Nineveh, but the whole context here. In 792 B.C., Jeroboam II began to reign in Israel. So we know that, that Nineveh was sometime during his reign. He reigned for 41 years. That was quite a while. About 770 B.C., we estimate, Jonah's ministry as we know it begins. And he goes off to, to, to Nineveh. About 745 B.C., the Assyrian Empire pushes westward under Tiglath-Pileser. 722 B.C., Israel is taken captive by Assyria and scattered to the winds, and we never hear of those northern ten tribes ever again, not as groups anyway. And then finally, in 612 B.C., Nineveh falls to the Medes, the Scythians, and the Babylonians, and it becomes a name in history, nothing more than a name in history. Now, how long after... Jonah, did Nim Nimina, uh did it fall? Nineveh. Nineveh fell about 150 years after Jonah. So it was good for 150 years. Yeah, yeah, quite a long time. <clears throat> well, one of the amazing things in the story of Jonah, apart from the fish story, uh, was their response, the Ninevites. Why do you think they would repent? I mean, what was Jonah's message? Repent or you're going to get destroyed. One sentence is the only message we have in the whole book. Repent, God's judgment is going to come on you. Did Repent they, or you'll be destroyed. Did they know who Jonah was? 
You've never been there before. You've certainly never been seen on TV or heard on radio. I mean, how would they know about him? And how would they know about <coughs> God? Yeah. Well, there would be a, a, a pretty good grapevine, I think. Uh, this guy got spit out on the shore by a big ship. And I'm no, a sure... Big fish. Big fish. I'm sorry. Big fish. Uh, uh, so he gets spit out on shore. Uh, th 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 that, that kind of news travels very quickly. Well, maybe Jonah was pretty good at telling his own story when he got there. Yeah. Do you suppose it's possible that um, he still had some evidence on him? He, but his story could have been corroborated by some uh, of those uh, people famous. on the boat. Yeah, possible. Some third and party. Some people on the shore. That yeah. Where he came uh, was thrown I, up. Yeah. I think I heard you say once that the acids inside the belly of a fish would turn Jonah's skin whiter. Some people have suggested maybe that. Maybe he had evidence still of his time in the belly of the whale, of the fish, whatever. That's possible. Of course, if God... With the digestive enzymes, even. Uh, if God um, performs them. a miracle to preserve Noah from drowning, Jonah. pardon me, Jonah from drowning, certainly he could pre protect his skin if he so desired. Yeah. But uh, yeah. maybe he chose to mm -hmm. let the skin be changed so that he would <clears throat> have more of an impression. Well, think about the response of the Ninevites and then look at these verses. This is a comment about the final end of the southern kingdom of Judah. It's found in 2 Chronicles 36. I'm going to read verses 16, I'm sorry, 15 and 16. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, had continued to send prophets to warn his people because they wanted to spare them, because he wanted to spare them and the temple. But they ridiculed God's messengers, ignoring his words and laughing at his prophets, until at last the Lord's anger against his people was so great that there was no escape. And what happens when God is angry with you? And how, how does that compare with the response of the Ninevites? Well, okay, let's, let's look at one more thing. How well did the king of Nineveh understand God? Look at his instructions to his people. Jonah 3, I'm going to start with verse 6. Jonah 3, starting with verse 6. When the king of Nineveh heard about it, about Jonah's preaching, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robes, put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. Now that was an ancient way of trying to represent your sorrow, your, your humility, your sadness about what's happened. He sent out a proclamation to the people of Nineveh. This is an order from the king and his officials. No one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle and sheep are forbidden to eat or drink not quite sure how you stop a cow or a sheep from eating or drinking, except maybe not provide them water. All persons and animals must wear sackcloth. Have you ever seen a cow wearing sackcloth? Everyone must pray earnestly to God and must give up his wicked behavior and his evil actions. Perhaps God will change his mind, perhaps he will stop being angry, and we will not die. Did he take Jonah seriously? You know, maybe the Assyrians were smart. And Sounds they, like he might have been. They knew, and they had a good king. They had a king that responded. Now, what else did you say? That I heard the solar eclipse and having mm -hmm. just experienced Two that. Two plagues, and it doesn't tell us exactly what no. type of plagues they were. That it all it just hit them just before that. Well, that had to have made a, an impression. Yeah. Yeah. to have Jonah follow these things. Mm -hmm. Because how would they have, I mean, I can see them being impressed and scared and whatever with Jonah's story, but, the, but to believe God would do these things, they had to have relied on something else that had happened in nature mm -hmm. prior to that. I mean, well, I mean, think of an enormous city 160,000 population, that's a pretty good sized city. This lonely stranger walks into town and starts preaching. What are the chances in our day, and under those kind of circumstances, that the king would ever even hear about him? Well, 
Well, he'd have gotten that ride in a police car to the <laughs> uh, hospital there, you know, where they got locks on the doors and mattresses on the walls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that I watched him for three days, I'm sure. Yes. How do you think that the, the king actually heard about Jonah? It doesn't say in this book. No. It just says Jonah went to the town and preached. It didn't say went to the palace. No. Hmm. So we can guess. <clears throat> but I suspect that, that he heard about the miracles. Mm -hmm. He had had these omens of these disasters before. Now here comes another miracle that has a message to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, hey, I better take this serious. Yeah. And, had, and he had everybody wearing sackcloth. That's what he says. I wonder what Jonah thought of on the, the next day when he came yeah. out and everybody was wearing sackcloth and repenting. Yeah. Well, if your king kills everyone that doesn't obey his rules, and the king says, put on sackcloth, you're going to put on sackcloth. <laughs> there, there might have been a shortage of sackcloth. That's an understatement. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, this king was not a Jewish person, no. but he obviously had a conscience, and he knew what they were doing was not right. Now, remember that in those days, it was believed that gods were attached to certain pieces of property. The Jewish God was around the Jewish territory. The Assyrian God was expected to reign in the Syria territory, and so forth and so forth, like that. So now to have the Jewish God come over and say something that might apply to the Ninevites was a pretty scary thing. And that meant that your property may soon be taken over by this Jewish God if you continue to displease That's him? That's a possibility. Well, wasn't well, you, it, uh, it, whoever had the most powerful God, too? That's and what they, right that's now, what, the Jewish it was believed whoever was God was the most powerful, that nation would win in war. Yeah. Yeah. Were you going to comment or? Well, I was just, no, because I was just worried about Jonah. I was thinking about Jonah when he was given the, the message to, to go up there and preach. Mm -hmm. And didn't they have a special way of skinning people alive that was... The, the Ninevites were known for beating people until they were black and blue, especially people who tried to resist them. Beating them until they're black and blue, and imagine how you would hurt, and then skinning them alive and, you know, po pasting up their skins as a warning. So I imagine Jonah knew something about that. A little, a little trepidation in his journey. And I could imagine going in there and talking to the king like this and ending up a skinned creature. Yeah. Well, now let's, let's, let's turn to Jonah now. Jonah has, can teach us a lot of lessons. Maybe not such good, maybe things we, good things not to do, but mm -hmm. anyway. Here was a successful prophet. He had predicted victory and battles, and it happened. And they said, boy, you know, you better listen to what Jonah has to say. He's a successful prophet. So when he, the second time around, when God tells him to go to Nineveh, and Nineveh is going to be destroyed, can you imagine him going to his friends and saying, well, I'm off for Nineveh. He said, You're off to Nineveh? Why would anyone go to Nineveh? Why would any Israelite, for sure, ever go to Nineveh? And he says, well, God has sent me up there. I'm going to preach to them, and the city's going to be destroyed. And they said, really? Single-handedly? You and God are going to wipe out the city of Nineveh? Wow! Hooray! I mean, wouldn't that be the response? Go, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Go, brother, yeah. Well, how do you suppose they felt when Jonah returned and announced that the Ninevites had uh, repented and the city was not destroyed? Well, what is uh, interesting is why did God want to send a message to a town that was not worshiping him? Mm -hmm. And why did God want to give Jonah this message for Nineveh? Why didn't God doesn't always just give a message to his people. He gives a message to other people also. But Jonah is the only prophet 
in the Old Testament who actually goes and delivers a message to a foreign nation. To Other, others, you know, Amos, we studied last week, Amos had messages for these other nations, but we have no evidence they ever went there or, or if they ever, ever, ever heard his messages. And a lot of prophets had messages for other nations, but we have no evidence that they actually went there. Yes. This is just one of those evidences that that God uh, is the God, uh, is, is, is the creator of all people, mm -hmm. and that everyone uh, is, his, is, his, is his child. We're all children of God. Uh, while Israel did enjoy a, a you know, favored nation status, uh, but God did not rule out. God uh, reached out reached out to, uh, to other, other countries on more than one occasion. You, you, you mean God cares about the Assyrians too? I believe so. <laughs> I believe Very so. good. Yeah. Well, the most important question now is we, we start to sort of drill down to where we really, what we really want to talk about. What picture of God did Jonah have? Well, I was, could, could have added a moment ago that that uh, I, I can easily hold this view of God reaching out to all of these uh, other nations. But if you were, if if you were um, a member of uh, a citizen of Israel or Judah, uh, you might not so easily tumble to that idea that that God cared about them. No. They had this isolationist that God only cares about us. The rest of you are are um, hopelessly lost anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, why would, you, why, why would you reach out to them? Well, Jonah was, look at Jonah 4. It's a short chapter, and it's the conclusion. And it says some very interesting things about Jonah and some very interesting things about God. Jonah was very unhappy about this, that, that the Ninevites had, had repented and that God was not going to destroy them, and became angry. So he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? Now, what does that imply? Jonah knew God that was a softy, that God would even forget, forgive the enemies of Israel if they repented, where Jonah maybe wanted them destroyed. Not only that, it sounds like he and God had had some conversations, isn't it? Yeah. Now we, it would be really good if we had those conversations recorded. We don't have those. They were probably in the belly of the whale. Well, before that. This is even before, before he left that. Home. Okay. Yeah. That's why I did my best to run away to Spain, Jonah says. I knew, notice this, I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, always ready to change your mind and not punish. So God, please don't ask me to do anything because I know you're too good. And Jonah is angry with that kind of God? Well, now Lord, let me die. I'm better off dead than alive. I mean, you've ruined my reputation, right? <clears throat> the uh, RSV says, I knew that thou art a, thou art a gracious God. Mm -hmm. do, do, do I have some people today say, no, now we're under grace? Mm -hmm. No, jo uh, Jonah knew clear back then. That's the way God is. He didn't change it at the cross. Yeah. This is not God who pours out some grace. This is no. a gracious God. That's the way he is. Yeah. So Jonah says, I'm better off dead than alive. The Lord answered, what right have you to be angry? Jonah went out east of the city and sat down. He made a shelter for himself and sat in its shade, waiting to see what would happen to Nineveh. He was hoping that God was going to do something anyway, right? Then the Lord God made a plant grow up over Jonah to give him some shade so that he would be more comfortable. <laughs> Jonah was extremely pleased with the plant. But at dawn the next day, at God's command, a worm attacked the plant and it died. After the sun had risen, God sent a hot east wind, and Jonah was about to faint from the heat of the sun, beating down on his head. I don't know if he was bald, but... So he wished he were dead. I am better off dead than alive, he said. That's the second time he said that. But God said to him, What right have you to be angry about the plant? Jonah replied, I have every right to be angry, angry enough to die. I mean, just look at this. The Lord said to him, This plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it, and you didn't make it grow, yet you feel sorry for it. 
How much more then should I have pity on Nineveh, that great city? After all, it has more than 120,000 innocent children in it, as well as many animals. RSV says, who did not know their right hand from their left? Yeah. <laughs> in other words, they're... Pretty, pretty, ignorant. pretty immature. You know what's interesting? God knows the hearts of evil uh, type cities. Like in Corinth, it was an evil city. God sent mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the disciples there. Oh, and wow. now Nineveh, uh, everybody yeah. looks at it as it's corrupt and God sent a disciple there. Yeah. So we are not to look at cities as too corrupt for God yeah. to reach. For us to work at. <clears throat> yeah. What, what do you think that God was trying to say here when he says, I've got 120,000 people that don't know the right hand from the left. There they were out there in sackcloth and repenting because the king told them to, I guess. Uh, they knew enough to do what the king well, I, said. I, I, think, I think a lot of them must have been repenting before the king even knew about it, before he made his command. My uh, Jonah didn't start off preaching to the king. So I, I think they took Jonah's message seriously. I mean, and how many people back in, in Israel took Jonah's message seriously? Well, then they did know their right hand from their left. They knew what to take seriously. Well, at least that much. Well, a lot of people did. It's, uh, the way I read it, this is 120,000 that are still immature, still young children. Yeah hundreds and thousands maybe of, of older people yeah. that maybe. did know and did repent. When I was in grade school, I had the privilege of living in Woburn, Massachusetts, just about five or six miles away from Lexington Square where the Revolutionary War started. And I read lots of stories about what happened in those days. And we, we think, and these must be young children who don't know the right from the left. And we because we have tools and instruments and we drive cars and all that stuff, we, we know all about right and left. You know that in the Revolutionary War, there were so few people who knew right from left that they would put straw in one foot, one shoe, and hay, a piece of hay in the other foot, uh, other shoe of the soldiers that fought in the Revolutionary War. And, and so they, instead of saying right foot, left foot, and right, left, right, left, they would say straw foot, hay foot, straw foot, hay foot. Serious. <laughs> So that's not such an outlandish idea. Okay. Well, you mentioned the Revolutionary War. I just wanted to point to the, f the fact of who these people were relative to the Jewish community that Jonah was coming from. Yeah. Uh, picture them as their worst enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, think about who our worst enemies might have been. Mm -hmm. uh, this would be like, like going to the uh, to Tokyo in uh, the late Italy. 40s yeah. or, or, or going to uh, uh, Germany in the, in, the, in the early 40s, you mm -hmm. know, that, uh, we had just or, or enormous... Or Moscow in the Russia during the middle of the Cold War. That's right. You know, it's, uh, uh, these were their most detestable enemies and Jonah was going to preach to them. Okay. Um, think of some other people. We just read of a very contentious discussion between Jonah and God. Think of some other people who had discussions with God. And well, Elijah had one. Elijah had one. Abraham. Job, Job had one. Abraham had one. Jo Joshua had one. Moses. Moses, yeah. And these people Basically, through scriptures, if you look at the whole context, most of them were standing up for God's reputation. That's what friends do. Was Jonah standing up for God's reputation? No, he's standing for He history. wasn't happy about the way God is, about God's character. I mean, can you believe it? Well, we have frequently asked, uh, how, how, did, how did this particular prophet come to light? You know, how was he chosen? Uh, Jonah, uh, maybe that was the best God had to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't Jonah thought with human priorities where God thinks with God's priorities, mm -hmm. my ways are not your ways, says God? 
How did Jonah know, going back in the story a little bit, how did Jonah know that when, if they threw him over the, the side of the ship, the, the storm would stop? Did he know? He, he told them. He told the sailors, throw me over and the storm will stop. He must have had a communication with God. Well, beforehand, he must have been pretty mature in his understanding, but still had the lot, uh, maybe an overdose of self-centeredness still to, to yes. wrestle with. Well, he had uh, a, a very guilty conscience. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if God speaks to you yeah. and says, I, I want you to go there, and you look over your shoulder and say, oops, I'm out of here, um, you, you can't forget that. I mean, when, mm -hmm. when, when God speaks to you and, and you That's rebel, yeah. 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 Well, you know, the ancient, many of the ancients believed that this, they looked at the ocean and remember those in the days when they had pretty small boats and sometimes the waves were pretty big and they believed that there was some kind of an evil god that lived there in the ocean sending those waves out all the time and he was perpetually angry. So, you know, what would be their natural response when there's a terrible storm comes up? Throw somebody in. Yeah. Throw somebody. Somebody. Yeah. Feed the monster. Yeah, feed the monster. Yeah. Well, where did Jonah think he had gone to when he was thrown over and he was swallowed by this fish or whale or whatever it was? Hell? Yes. <laughs> he says, I went down into the grave, into the belly of Sheol some of the more literal translations. Some, some translations say the tomb of the dead or the womb of Hades or even the world of the dead. So what does that tell us about his understanding of death? Did he think any moment he might be dead? Do you, you think God sent a light down there for him to uh, see how things were coming along? So he thought when you were dead, you were conscious and you were able to think and... He ex I think he expected at any moment it was going to be all over. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think when they picked him up, yeah, he recognized it was all over, that he was about to experience the wrath of God. Yeah. Well, what was Jonah really afraid of? You say up there, his own reputation. Yeah. yeah. Well. <clears throat> on what basis would he say that he, he, his reputation might have been destroyed? Look at, look at these comments I'm reading now from the RSV, the Revised Standard Version. And this is Deuteronomy 18, 21 and 22, talking about prophets. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Okay, my good news Bible will put it these way, this way. You may wonder how you can tell when a prophet's message does not come from the Lord. If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and what he says does not come true, then it is not the Lord's message. That prophet has spoken on his own authority and you're not to fear him. So what would the people say about Jonah when he came back home? He's not a prophet of God because his prophecy did not come true. Jonah, what happened to you? I thought you were going to destroy Nineveh all by yourself. Well, he said if they don't repent, and they repented, so the fact that they're not destroyed shows that he, what he said was true, what Jonah said was true. You think that would have been a very convincing argument? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, what do we know about this book? Now, let's think about, many people don't ask this question. When was the book of Jonah written? Not, I'm not talking about a year. I'm talking about in terms of the story. When do you think the book was written? Well, after the story. After the yeah. story. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> after he's back in, back home in yeah. Judah, right? right. Mm -hmm. He sits down and he writes out this story. Would you, if you had been Jonah, would you have written this book about yourself? He was very open and transparent in writing wow. this book. <clears throat> he laid all his faults on the line. Maybe he learned something from this as well. <laughs> I hope so. And, and I mean, it follow the story down. I mean, 
Who looks good in this story? God looks yeah. good. God looks good? The Ninevites. The Ninevites, the Ninevites look, good. look good? Who looks bad in this story? The only one, Jonah. Jonah <laughs> and the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he doesn't talk much about them, but are they repenting? The Ninevites repent. A huge city out there, they all repent and they're all saved, presumably. And he comes back to Samaria or I don't know exactly where he lived there, but and were they paying any attention to him? I mean, Jonah writes this book, and if we're to believe that he's writing this book about himself, he's a villain. He's an evil guy. But if he wrote the book, <clears throat> then he had to write the part about the Ninevites repenting, about yeah. the king ordering sackcloth and ashes. Yes. I, I don't know if I would call him a villain. I think I would call him a chicken. <laughs> sort of like, <laughs> sort of okay. like Peter uh -huh. that denied uh -huh. Jesus. Yeah. Jonah is denying his calling. Well, if you care about God's reputation, would you say Jonah is a great book to read? If you're interested in, by contrast. By, by contrast. <laughs> I think it shows that God is interested in all the people on the earth. Mm -hmm. So here, as we've mentioned already, Jonah is the only one of these minor prophets we're studying who actually leaves his country, travels a long ways over inhospitable territory to get to a place to preach a, mes preach a message to a foreign nation. Can you read the message Jonah preached? Was, was it a long message? Was yeah, it? I can read the message very easily. What exactly did he say? It is, of course, there, he must have said more than this, but uh, this, is, this is his message. It's found in Jonah chapter 3, Verse 4, Jonah started through the city, and after walking a whole day, he proclaimed, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's, that's the total of his message that we have recorded in his book. And so the people knew from that to repent. Well, I'm sure he said more than that, but that's uh -huh. what's recorded. It takes three days to get through the city, so he walked into it one day, so he was a third of the way across. And then he starts preaching, right in the middle well, of it. You know, people have looked at that and figured that it probably took three days to like walk up and down all the streets. Oh. Probably, probably not all three days to walk all the way. You walked quite a ways all the way in, in three days. Nineveh was not that big. What's, uh, what's the significance of 40 in this? It seems like 40 comes up in yeah. the Bible here and there. And yeah. this is Jesus went out to be tempted for 40 days. Mm -hmm. um, do you see anything, anything, any connection? I, I'm not sure that it has any connection. I, I presumably, this is what God told him to say. Uh, I, I have to assume that. Mm -hmm. They wandered for 40 years. They wandered for 40 years. The spies spent 40 days exploring the land of, of, of Canaan. <coughs> kind of a uh, completeness of maybe yeah. of a number. You've had your chance type number? Mm -hmm. Maybe. And I'm struck with, with uh, ch uh, chapter 4, verse 2 again. Mm -hmm. He says, For I knew that thou art a, art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and repentest of evil. In other words, he's telling how he thought of, on his picture of God before he t had this, this experience that's recorded here. Mm -hmm. And yet he went his own self-centered, yeah. unresponsive way. Well, outside of a few isolated cases, how many prophets, let's just put it this way, how many prophets do we know of in the Old Testament that had a clear, very successful message? We, we read right in there, they prophesied this and this and this, and it happened. And the people repented. Well, very or, few. Or, they, Jonah. Or, they, or they accomplished. Jonah is one. There are actually a couple more we're going to talk about shortly. Who talked to Josiah? Where they read the where they yeah. read the book yeah. and they but he, he's not a writing prophet, so yeah. and the repent well build the temple. Yeah, Haggai and Zechariah, yeah. they got up there and they preached, and boy, the people woke up and in a short period of time they well, I mean it took them three or four years, but they and then Ezra and Nehemiah, well, yeah. it's particularly Nehemiah, fifty-two days, bang, they had finished the wall. So there were some who had success, mm -hmm. and but Jonah's 
One of the first. And Nehemiah, he not only preached, but didn't he pull beards if they didn't listen mm -hmm. to him? <laughs> but as far as changing people's view or religion, mm -hmm. it sounds like Jonah is the one. Pretty remarkable. Yeah. Well, why do you suppose this book was preserved? By the Jews. I mean, preserved by the Jews and passed on to a Christian audience, and we still keep it in our Bibles. Well, I, I think that it makes God look very good, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's worth, worth keeping for that reason. But we can see ourselves in, in this thing, too, mm -hmm. and uh, it might be worth us taking a good look at Jonah here. Would we uh, canonize, preserve and canonize a book that uh, portrayed our worst enemies, maybe atheists, in a good light and Adventists in a bad light? Mm -mm. Well, well, how do you tell <clears throat> the story of the fish without including the rest of it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's a story that, uh, that's got to be told. You mean about his spitting up the Jonah? Yeah. 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 Is this for our instruction that we are supposed to go out um, to other people groups? Sounds like it. Yeah. Well, all of this apparently was meant to shake up Israel out of their self-centeredness and lead them to begin to reach out to other nations. Wasn't that God's original plan? What they were supposed to be doing? And now they have come just about to the end of their time and God's making one last appeal, please, you know, let me send my prophet out. I know he didn't want to. He wanted to go the other direction, but at least he did something. What about the rest of you? What are you doing? You know? And again, this is the nation that captured the northern kingdom of Israel a few years later. Yep. And within 50 them years. Into, the, into yeah. oblivion. Yeah. Well... What would God, do you think God would ever send a Jonah to us? Maybe he has. Maybe he has. In, in passing, as we're about running out of time, let me mention once again that um, our materials that we talk about, we use as our guide in the study here, are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You might find some of these materials interesting to add a little color to your Sabbath school class. Well, the book says a lot more about God than it does about Jonah. God is absolutely sovereign. Think about this. God is absolutely sovereign over his creation. He controlled the sea. He sent messages to Jonah. He controlled the fish. He controlled the plant that Jonah sat under as he watched from a distance to see Nineveh being destroyed. He even controlled the worm that killed the plant. I mean, what does that say to you? It is likely that Jonah was the very first, very first prophetic book to be written. First book to be written by a prophet, unless, of course, you consider Moses as a prophet. He was in a sense, but he wasn't a, like a professional prophet. He probably wrote in the 770s B.C., somewhere between 770 and 750, during the reign of Jeroboam II, who reigned from 793 to 753. The Assyrian kings during that time were Adad and Merari III from 810 to 753. He reigned for a long time. And Ashurdan III, 771 to 754. So those two were co-regents. During the latter part of Jeroboam II's reign, the ministries of Amos and Hosea in the northern kingdom and Isaiah and Micah in the southern kingdom also took place. So we don't know for sure, but it's possible that while Amos and Hosea are preaching in the north and Isaiah and Micah are preaching in the south, Jonah is preaching in Nineveh. Could the uh, reason this book have been kept is that if you repent, God will... Um, not let you go. He'll continue. He'll protect you. And there were so few of cases where the Jewish nation did repent that this was an example to the Jewish nation. What can happen if you do repent in in a corporate, <coughs> total national way? Sure. But didn't the Jewish nation repent 
almost seven times because they'd go into captivity and repent and then come back and back in the days of the judges yeah and, yeah. and back and forth they'd go into captivity yeah. and god would save them once again well what are we supposed to learn from the book of jonah We've said it's more about God than it is about Jonah. God's name appears something like 39 times in the book, and Jonah's name only appears like 18 times. So what are we supposed to learn about God? Well, one thing, uh, you know, I think we sort of dismiss Israel. They, they were the rebellious uh, tribes, and they got what they deserved, and that's, that's, that's the end of them. Mm -hmm. But here we see God working with a prophet in Israel. Mm -hmm. in rebellious Israel that's working with Yahweh that sends him off to Nineveh and Assyria and so forth. So God hasn't given up uh, on, on the northern tribes. No. We mentioned here that God changes his mind about Nineveh. We don't have time to spend a lot of time in this. Does God change his mind? Jonah 3, 9 and 10. There's verses through the Old Testament that say God doesn't change his mind. In fact, in one chapter it says God doesn't change his mind, then it says he changed his mind, then it says he doesn't change his mind. In 1 Samuel 15, verses 10, 11, 29, and 31, right there in one chapter. And there's other places, Malachi 3, 6, God is not like a human being, he doesn't change his mind. But was it fair to set, for God to, to choose a successful prophet and send him to a place far away to give such a journey and give such a message and, and have to travel all the way back and say, it didn't happen. But people were saved. Mm -hmm. People, yeah, he should be happy. He and could what, have come back dancing and joyous because it didn't happen. Okay. His message was successful. But they're his enemies. Let's not forget that. It, uh, Adventists have been preaching for almost 170 years that Jesus is coming very soon. Do we sound a little bit like Noah? I'm sorry, a little bit like Jonah? Well, I hope the world uh, gets in sackcloth and repents. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> we sometimes now, we're almost a, afraid to say that we're Adventists and that time is coming to an end. But it is, and it's coming to an end for our program for today. Think about the message of Jonah. See you next week.